Yeah. So I think cognitive enhancement is a big deal because thinking is what underpins not just uh, our normal daily life, but actually what's going on in society and our ability to decide for ourselves what our future is going to be. So better thinking could lead to much better lives. The problem is, of course, that improving our brains is not easy because we're very complicated objects. It's kind of surprising, actually, that there exist drugs that improve brains in certain directions. They don't improve them in general. It's not as if you took a pill and everything became better. But there are drugs, for example, that improve uh, the learning ability to some extent because memory encoding gets better. There are drugs that make you more alert, which is useful in situations where you need to be more alert. There are drugs that affect attention and focus, which is again useful in both situations. Now, one size does not fit everybody. Uh, so different people react also quite individually to this, but uh, they look like very useful tools for fine tuning our cognition, especially since we're living in a world that's not working in the same way as the ancient African savanna where we evolved. The kind of problems we, our brains evolved to deal with was you know, avoiding predators, finding food and impressing uh, our friends and relatives. Okay, the last part is still true, but the number of predators around is very small. The actual predators today are cars. They're very dangerous uh, objects, which we can't outthink in the same way as we would be outthinking a lion. And our attention, well, ideally we should be able to focus on computers and documents and text which is utterly different from the kind of widespread attention that would be useful to scout the savanna for something to eat. So actually adjusting our brains to the world we have created can be very useful. Of course, we could try to change our own world too, but I don't think we want to give up our nice cozy houses and good food for living on the savanna, although we would be well adapted to it. So the problem with cognitive enhancers is that most drugs scare people. We find a cup of coffee to be something cultured and elegant, but taking a little pill to become alert, oh, that's creepy. Uh, so we put them in different mental categories. And I think this is a mistake. The coffee is just as much a cognitive enhancer as a modafinil pill. It's just that the coffee is surrounded by a lot of nice social rules and tradition, and it also has a lot of aesthetic value. And we also know when to say, and say no, I shouldn't be drinking more coffee. We handle that because we have a long history. Meanwhile, the new pills, we don't yet know what good social norms should surround. And a lot of this confusion, of course, leads to big debates about should students be allowed to take cognition enhancing drugs when uh, they're studying. And the real problem is that it depends on what they're studying for. If school and especially university is all about gathering information and putting it into your brain, then obviously you should uh, do anything that can improve a learning rate. But some people would obviously say, no, 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 the point is growing as a human. You need to learn things, but they're not uh, the things in the textbook. You need to interact with other people, have other ideas. That would suggest, actually suggest other drugs, including beer in the pub. Just hanging around socially you know, with other people can actually be quite important. And again, lowering inhibitions to a suitable level might actually be a very smart thing. But yet again, another reason we have universities is to prove that uh, you know, some people are skilled and know certain things, and then they get a nice document with a stamp on it telling that, yes, this person can solve this kind of problem. In that case, of course, drugs and the other things that affect the ability might actually send off the wrong signals because the, those stamped documents might no longer hold very true. But again, it depends on what activity you do. So we might be worried about sportsmen taking drugs because it makes the competitions uninteresting. Because there we care about the competition and fairness. Meanwhile, if a mathematician takes a stimulant that allows him to prove deeper theorems, well, that's good because we care about the theorems, not how he came up with them. It might be a good story that he came up with the theorem while in the bath or taking drugs or using a crystal ball. It doesn't really matter as much as the theorem being true. So a lot of the debate about cognition enhancing drugs is really a confusion about what we actually want to achieve because most of the time we don't think carefully about that. And this leads, of course, to a lot of very strong emotions because most of us have some intuitions that we're very bad at articulating what society should be about, what our institutions should be about, and of course, what our intake of nutrients and chemicals should be about. I think we're going to find a lot of very strange ways of enhancing our brains. So chemicals are an obvious way, but they're also fairly crude. A pill doesn't contain many bits of information. 
Meanwhile, you have computer games, which are very interesting because they catch our attention. They make us focus on various things and they actually teach us to do things. So it turns out that avid computer gamers are noticeably different when it comes to visual attention, reaction speed and so on. It might be that uh, they could, you could train people by the right kind of computer game. Some of the most interesting work recently has been about training working memory using particular computer games that really force you to expand your working memory which seems to sometimes carry over to solving intelligence test tasks. That might actually make you smarter. So a lot of people are trying to make brain training games and uh, hoping that that's going to uh, fix at least the problem of dementia and Alzheimer's, which is somewhat uh, questionable because a lot of these games actually haven't been proven to help. But there are other ways too. So one interesting thing is to use various uh, electrical currents to stimulate or uh, dis-stimulate parts of the brain. So again, if you know a particular part of the brain is involved in some task, you can make it slightly more plastic and slightly more eager to learn things. Or you can have another part that is interfering with your task, get it out of the loop. For example, you can enhance memory and creativity this way. Not an enormous amount, but it's a fairly simple thing. Which again leads to interesting ethical uh, questions because uh, uh, some people are already holding uh, batteries uh, to their heads and thinking that that's going to affect them. And it is probably going to affect them, except that we don't put them in the right place and we probably don't even know which polarity to use. More seriously, I think uh, in the long run, we're going to find ways of enhancing our brains by using interactions with computers that support us uh, and we offload a lot of our mental tasks onto the computers. But we also have very smart interfaces that learn from us and interact very effectively. In the really long run, of course, we can envision brain-computer interfaces although they need to be ridiculously good in order to be uh, useful. Uh, nobody would like to go to the hospital and uh, risk at least uh, 0.1% uh, risk of death in order to get a new cell phone. You don't really want that. You want to go to the shop and just get a new gadget. It's external, but you have a good interface using your fingers and your eye and your ears um, to interact with it. Implanting a chip that allowed you access to the internet would need to be much, much better than anything you can do externally. So I think the real killer application that is really going to get people to want to get a neural interface is rather far into the future and probably in itself very different from what we currently expect. But we're getting better ways of interacting with our nervous system. So it's not just a matter of electrodes stimulating nerve cells to get them to fire or not. They are working in optogenetics where you transfect cells with new genes that make them light sensitive. So now you can shine laser light and the cells themselves fire it. So this way, it might be possible to make much more gentler and much more high-precision neural interfaces. It's still very early days, but I think we're going to see some pretty amazing things here. And of course, further on, we're seeing more and more nanotechnology applications where you can both get drugs into exactly the right spot in the brain, and then uh, let uh, nanocapsules open up and uh, spread the chemical just those neurons that need them. But also you might be able to make nanointerfaces. You inject stuff that self-assemble in the right spot, you can maybe guide that using magnetic fields from the outside, and then you get something that's effective. It's still rather far off. And the biggest problem is, however, design, figuring out how to talk to the brain. Fortunately, the brain is a learning system. So already experiments on plugging in the implants into monkey brains and having a computer learn what signals correspond to what actions of the monkey have been fairly successful, mainly because the brain is adapting to the computer and vice versa. They're both kind of learning systems that want to figure out how to grab that banana with the robotic arm. So it might turn out that some of these interface problems are easier than we think. As soon as we get tools that can actually work well in the body, which is a very harsh environment for any technology because it's full of uh, immune cells that are doing their best to throw out any invader and anything they don't recognize. Uh, well, people have always been complaining about their memories, uh, not about the judgment, which I think is very telling, but typically forgetfulness has been regarded as a problem. So already in antiquity, people were coming up with memory arts that allowed them to, to memorize a lot of information. And this turned into a high art in the Renaissance. People developed memory palaces, uh, virtual spaces in their own heads where they could put information. And since it was harder to get books, it was a good idea to memorize the contents of books uh, since you couldn't lug them around. Today, of course, most of these practices have fallen out of fashion simply because they take time to learn and we can write things down on cheap paper or on even cheaper electronic files. 
But some people really do learn memory arts, and they can memorize several decks of cards. They can memorize large amounts of information, mostly for fun, of course. But, but the most interesting thing is, if you put them into a brain scanner, uh, Martin Dressler at the Max Planck Institute for Psychology in, in Germany has been working a bit on this. You can see that their brains are completely normal. They're not abnormal people with super memories. No, they're normal people who, for some reason, decided to learn a memory art that now allows them to memorize enormous amount of information. But only in particular categories. If you show them snowflakes, uh, which we don't have a memory art for, they are just as bad as anybody else. It give them numbers and no problem memorizing uh, 100 digit numbers. So what has happened over time is that people have found different needs and niches. And of course, as technology went on, people also invented uh, drugs that could enhance uh, memory. So Lashley, the American neuroscientist, he did experiments in about 1917 on rats where he was trying to figure out where memory was located. And he also found that with the poison strychnine, which is a stimulant if you give it in a sufficient low doses, actually improved the memory of the rats. And typical, of course, any stimulant will tend to make you more alert, you pay a bit more attention, and you tend to remember better. So uh, a whole bundle of stimulants would work as memory enhancers, although they of course have a bit of side effects simply because they might also be addictive and make you a bit jumpy and so on. So over the years, people have invented various groups of chemicals. Uh, so there are another group of chemicals that were invented in order to treat Alzheimer's. And uh, so these cholinergic drugs try to replace the amount of acetylcholine lost because you know, some relevant part of the brain lose function in Alzheimer's. And they do help against uh, some Alzheimer's symptoms in memory. And they also help normal people, which of course some people started uh, to think that's a good idea, so they were taking it. Meanwhile, since these drugs are kind of prescription drugs and some of them have sl slightly nasty side effects, other people were taking amino acids and thinking, okay, this is nootropic, this is going to make me smarter. That's a bit more questionable. Typically, our brains are fairly good at uh, handling uh, even hard work. We don't run out of our signal substance under normal conditions. It can happen. There are some interesting military experiments about using the amino acid tyrosine, which gets turned into signal transmitters in the brain, in uh, American soldiers during Hell Week. And this is an experiment that you couldn't do on civilians because no ethics board would ever allow you to treat civilians in the same way as the military does, of course, during hard marine training. And during that kind of condition, those real extreme situations, apparently brains might actually run out of some substance, so giving extra tyrosine would be a smart thing. Now, this leads to the question, what kind of drugs are we taking in our everyday life that affect our cognition? And one of the most obvious ones is sugar. It turns out that our blood sugar levels affect our thinking quite a lot, so especially when thinking hard, we might have occasional dips in blood sugar that impairs us. So actually maintaining the right blood sugar level is a good thing. Now, this requires a bit of self-monitoring, and maybe in the near future we might use some of the tools developed to help diabetics to actually see how, what is my current blood sugar level and how should I get it up or down. So, in general, I think we're going to, in the future, do personalized medicine for a lot of these enhancements. You're going to have your little gadgets monitoring you, and you're also going to record how well you function. And after a few months of life recording like that, you can start mining it and figure out, when do I need a biscuit? When should I really avoid having something sweet? And when is the right time for a cup of coffee? And it might turn out that different people have very, very different uh, preferences and systems for this, because it depends on how you think and what you do with your brain. I, th I think one of the things that concerns people most in Europe is, of course, equality. The idea that, uh, oh, the haves are going to get enhanced and they're going to get the kids enhanced and the have-nots are going to remain stupid and uh, even, you get an even more entrenched uh, social differences. I think in case of cognitive enhancer drugs, this is completely overblown because you can make drugs very, very cheap. The real problem is, of course, social capital. We know, for example, that well-off parents, they're very good at telling the doctors that the kids got ADHD, so they get Ritalin and they might do better in school. Meanwhile, parents who are not socially competent are going to have a harder time. So the result is over-prescription and under-prescription already. But the drug itself is fairly cheap as soon as the patent goes out. And if a cognitive enhancer of any kind turn out to be really useful, you could imagine subsidizing it. So there are ways around that. The real problem is any enhancement that is a service. If you need to go to an enhancement spa and have somebody uh, do something complicated with your brain, in that case you need to pay for the salary. That's not going to go down in price. That's going to be expensive and uh, hence it's going to be a, a relative privilege. 
sometimes we think that even very expensive services are worthwhile, so we actually subsidize them and run it on the tax system. Education is such an example. We actually spend an, an, an enormous amount of time for this, an enormous amount of money, and we don't even monitor very carefully how to do it better. It's kind of amazing, actually, how little we try to improve education. Mostly, of course, because most people think we already know how to do it right, which is most likely completely wrong. Applying a bit of experimental design techniques would probably help us figure out how to do education far better. But it's, of course, a political minefield because teachers, unions, parents, children, everybody think they know how it should be done.